Welcome. Good so it's be been here. it's been one year since you took over the leadership of the NDP. Where have you been? What have you been doing? I've been everywhere, man. I've been to the Northeast. I've been to the Northwest. I've been to the Kootenays. I've been to the Caribou a half dozen times, to Kamloops, up and down Vancouver Island, and, and all of the suburbs here in the Lower Mainland. But what have you been doing when you're there? Talking to people, making new friends, trying to convince people that we can do better in British Columbia than we've been doing over the past 15 years. It's my view that the BC Liberals appeal to a narrow band of the population. I think politics should be about a broader band of people bringing in everyone in the equation, whether they be entrepreneurs, trade unionists, or just regular folk. I think that BC is an amalgam of all of its parts, and Liberals don't look at it that way. They look at quick profit, quick gain. I think we need to look long term. How do we do that, though, in a province that is shifting? There's no doubt that we're moving away from having been pretty much solely resource-based, and we're moving to a little bit more of an intelligence-based uh, economy, and yet how do we make that spread throughout the province when those opportunities aren't there? Well, you have to be able to do more than one thing at a time. And the BC Liberals for the past three or four years have been talking about nothing else but liquefied natural gas. I was at a sawmill in Williams Lake just last week. Young people running the mill. The, the, the plant manager was 39 years old. There is a shift. There is a demographic shift happening in the resource sector and everybody wants to see what we can do about maximizing the benefit from our resources. And all the province wants to talk about is LNG. In the lower mainland, you've got the high tech sector is booming, film, services, providing health care to an aging community is also an economic activity and the government doesn't seem to look at it that way. There's a lot going on in British Columbia, always has been and there always will. But if we don't have a government that understands that there is a diverse population, rural, urban, suburban, we're going to be hamstrung. The classic example is the referendum going on right now in the Lower Mainland about public transit. Public transit is not a debt to society, it's an investment in society. And if we can't move people and goods and services around in our large metropolitan area, we're going to be hamstrung economically. These are simple equations, but the government doesn't seem to pick them up. LNG, 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 not how do we grow the Lower Mainland in a, in a, in a way that benefits everybody. So let's talk about LNG. Where, where are you on LNG? Should we move forward? Uh, when I worked in governments uh, in the 1990s, I worked in the energy field. I, I know a lot about it. I know a lot about electricity. I know a lot about natural gas. And we started the Oil and Gas Commission in the 1990s to take advantage of the amount, a massive amount of resource that we do have in the Northeast. And I believe that if we can get it to a higher price market, we should. But I have said from the beginning, and this is the irony of the Social Democrats saying that the market will decide these things. These are massive investments by private sector companies. We, the people of BC, own the resource. If we can sell it for a profit to the people of BC, create jobs, dial in First Nations who are the founding peoples in the North and in every other corner of British Columbia, and make sure that we're doing it in a sustainable way, let's go. I'm all in. But if we're going to abandon our basic principles about getting a fair return for our resource, if we're going to give it away, and if we're going to use temporary foreign workers to run the industry, then where's the benefit to BC? Now, the argument about the temporary foreign workers is that they, those people are actually right now the expertise that we need to be able to build this industry, and that's really why they're here. Uh, because we don't have that expertise locally. We have tradespeople that can accomplish uh, the construction of facilities on the coast. We have people working in the sector right now in the oil fields, the gas fields of the, of, the, of the northeast of British Columbia. I think that's a hollow argument. I think that the Liberals are using that rather than investing in, in training, rather than making sure that we have the skilled people for the next generation of resource jobs. They're deferring to offshore temporary foreign workers because it's easier and it's cheaper for the companies that want to come here. If, in my view, if someone's good enough to come and work here, they're good enough to uh, get citizenship. I'm the son of an Irish immigrant. My father came here to make a better life for himself and he came with a plan for citizenship, not handing his passport to the boss and then being told to go home when the job was done. I think there is a place for temporary foreign workers, but not a dominant place, particularly in our resource sector. We need to train the next generation of tradespeople, men and women. Kids are ready to go. I have two kids that are just out of university. They're looking for things to do. My friends are kids, have kids looking for things to do. They don't want to hear about temporary foreign workers. They want to hear about training opportunities for their children and the children of their neighbors. Where are you at on pipelines? We've got two major initiatives that are kind of underway yeah. right now. 
Well, I think the, uh, the Enbridge Northern Gateway plan is virtually dead. We're on the heels of an election in Alberta right now where the leading party, the New Democratic <laughs> Party, ironically, is a certainly said that let's, let's give the Northern Gateway a pass. There's no right of way there. There's no existing infrastructure. First Nations are concerned. People along the coast are concerned about a, uh, an increase in tanker traffic where none currently exists. Now, the, the Kinder Morgan process is another kettle of fish altogether. Mm -hmm. There's an existing pipe there. The companies got their application before the National Energy Board. Hearings are going on now. I believe that investment needs to be able to make their case. We have what we call citizen regulators now. If you know anyone's got a, access to the internet, can have an opinion on these projects. Mm -hmm. And that's fair game. But we need to have a process so that investment can make their case and if, if it can be proven that it can be done sustainably, they should proceed. But if it can't be done sustainably, then the permit shouldn't be issued. My concern today about Kinder Morgan is the federal government's got all the cards here. The province gave away our ability to manage this process by saying we'll have a, a one-stop a one -stop shop here when it comes to pipelines. I think British Columbians don't like that. I think British Columbians want to be in control of their destiny. Mining is another uh, major sector, or has been mm -hmm. over the years. When we look back to the government of Mike Harcourt, he almost all but stopped it. Where are you out on mining? Well, uh, first I, I'll correct you on the Mike Harcourt statement. There were mines that did open up in the 1990s, but copper was 65 cents a pound, and now it's up around four and a half dollars a pound. So there's copper in the ground in British Columbia, lots of it, and investors want to get access to that, and they want to get it to high price markets, particularly in Asia. Forestry. Mm. Uh, interesting situation in forestry. The co we've got the coastal industry and then we've got the interior. Yeah. It's as though they're uh, not even connected any Night longer. Night and day. I, mm -hmm. I grew up on Vancouver Island. I've worked uh, in a pulp mill. I've worked in a sawmill. I've worked in a uh, value-added facility making door jam and window frames. And, and the coastal industry is now all about exporting raw logs. A 500% increase in raw log exports over the past 10 years. As a Vancouver Islander, I see trucks full of logs. I see no mills. Mm -hmm. Those logs are all going somewhere else. Now, I, as I said, I was at, in Williams Lake. I've been to mills in uh, Prince George as well, and also in the Kootenays. And the coastal industry is just a, a pale impersonation of what it was when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And, and the, 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 uh, the forest workers are just no longer there, 25,000 fewer now than a decade ago. But Which in the is interior, a remarkable drop. Oh, and, and yeah. Significant. And that's why the, the diversification of the economy on Vancouver Island and in the lower mainland, where there were a lot of mills. I mean, people look along the Fraser River in Surrey and out towards uh, Chilliwack. All those mills are shuttered now. There's, there's still activity, but most of the activity is getting the logs in the water and sending them somewhere else. The interior is another matter altogether. The beetle kill, the, the pine beetle mm -hmm. infestation, has led to a really significant harvest of, of dead wood. And now they're starting to bring in more green wood. One of the, as I said, the mill operator in Williams Lake was saying, we're, we're getting more green wood now. And, and I was looking in their log sort, and the logs are getting bigger. So they're going farther afield. They're cutting older growth uh, forests, not by coastal standards. I mean, we have big, big trees here, still do, happily. But in the, in the interior, it's a different matter. And, mm -hmm. and the, the, the fall down in the annual allowable cut in the Prince George region is going to have an impact on employment in the very near term. Government doesn't want to talk about that. Christy Clark's all about LNG, not about forestry. And if I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times. Government needs to focus on a whole bunch of things at once, not just a pet project. So LNG, pipelines, uh, mining, forestry, they represent a significant portion of the labor market. And, our, res and our, our resource wealth as well, C coming exactly. to the Crown to pay for the social services that we all expect. So coming up against that, though, we've got the environmental movement that almost seems to say, no, 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 no. Uh, and how do you reconcile that? Because so, so often the environmental movement tends to uh, line up a little bit more behind the principles of the NDP than they do the Liberals. And yet you wind up in this conflict of how do you satisfy mm -hmm. both of those uh, portions or parts of your party? I, I made a deliberate choice to become an elected official. And when you do that, I think you have to leave your bullhorn at the door. There are many politicians who want to continue to be activists, social activists, environmental activists, the labor activists, um, entrepreneurs, they want to continue to drive home the need to reduce taxes or, or whatever their issue might be. And that's good. You need to have people in the community in all of those sectors, in all of those areas, 
pushing government and decision makers to make sure that there's balance when you're making those final policy decisions that have an impact on all of our lives. But as an elected representative, I, I didn't get elected to go to the protest and say, this won't happen. I got elected to try and find what we can accomplish. What is the art of the possible? And politics was an avenue for me to exercise that desire to find justice and equality in my community. And I've been, I've been hooked on it ever since. And we can manage the fiscal side of the equation. We can manage the social side. I believe I can go into lunchrooms and boardrooms and have the same, same message, and that's a message of harmony. Let's work together, labor, capital, and the environment to make a better BC. I'll come back to that in a sure. moment, but uh, right, right now I also want to address, we have First Nations, and they are playing an ever-increasing important role in the development of how the economy of BC is going to move forward, especially in the resource sector. I think it's fair to say these are uncertain times mm -hmm. when it comes to what direction do we go in. We've got the Silcoteen decision, we've got the treaty process that seems to be stalled, um, and then and we have First Nations who are saying, who needs the treaty process anyways? The courts are giving us what, what, what we want. And that leaves business and a number of other people going, mm, okay, which way do I go? Yeah. And we keep hearing over and over and over again that business and investment money wants certainty. How do we fix this? I think that for me it's an opportunity and if we're going to break this impasse, this, this uncertainty, that has been around not just for the past couple of years but it's been around for decades. If we're going to break that uncertainty we need to have that land base figured out and the Silcoteen decision I think has trumped everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a treaty process for 25 odd years and 23 years into that. Some success, some obvious failures and then we have another block of First Nations, another hundred or so First Nations that don't want anything to do with the treaty process. They don't want to extinguish their rights. They believe they have rights and it's not for them to give them away. It's to hand those rights down to successive generations. And the Silcoteen decision said quite clearly the Supreme Court not only established rights and title in theory and in law, but in practice. They have a map that says this is your territory. Mm -hmm. and, and that is going to change the debate on the land base from now until the end of time. And I think that's a good thing. We now know, no more, let's not spend any more money on litigation. There's the answer. The Supreme Court has ruled that treaty title, exi pardon me, title exists. So let's, just, let's move on. And if you've got capital, if you want to invest on the land base in British Columbia, go to that First Nation in that area and say, how can we be partners? And they're going to find a receptive audience when they come to that door. As it is now, First Nations, the Carrier Sikani Tribal Council, for example, in the Prince George area, they don't have the capacity to deal with all of the requests for access to this area or that area, whether it be on pipeline routes for gas or, or uh, cutting rights or I want to put a wind turbine in your area. So they continue to get all of these requests for engagement but not as partners, as just I, I have a duty to consult, says the law, mm -hmm. here's my consultation, I sent you a letter, now I'm moving on. But that's on. the old law, the that's new right. law is that you have to get, that's have, right. have consen consent, not just consult but to get consent. Uh, agreed, yeah. and, and so th that Silcoteen decision has changed the field forever, so no longer is it the responsibility of the lawyer for the company that wants to invest to just write a couple of letters, they have to sit down, they have to knock on the door, can I set up a meeting, can we talk about how we partner on a very exciting idea that we have, which is what would happen, Stu, if someone came to, to you and said, I've got an exciting idea for your backyard. Let's partner on this. So the challenge from my perspective is I go, okay, we'll go ahead and do that. But the amount of money starts to now get uh, divided up. What just shot right past the First Nation. Now the, a portion of that money will stay with them and that will at some point diminish the amount of money that gets through to the provincial government affecting and, and, budgets. And to the investor. And yes. to the investor. But if First Nations are making money, they're not just sticking in the pile. They're distributing it through their community. They're buying goods and services in the local town. They're stimulating economic activity. So it's not as if, okay, all that money is now gone from the equation. It's just going to be circulating in different hands. And there will be benefit to the Treasury through sales taxes. There'll be benefit to the Treasury through whatever other activity those First Nations want to take up. If they want to put in place uh, a new remanufacturing forest uh, component in an in a area of their territory, they're going to have to buy that equipment. And they're going to have to pay tax on that equipment. And on and on and on it goes. So to say that you're going to take some of the money away from the government and some of the money away from the investor, 
doesn't mean it disappears. It's still going to be circulating and it's going to be benefiting a broader group of people. And if there's more capital in your pocket, you're likely to spend it, particularly if you had zero when you started. And that's the case for many First Nations. Well, I've talked to a number of First Nations leaders who say, you want to solve our social problems? Give us access to opportunity. Mm -hmm. Allow us to bring prosperity into our communities. And, and I'm, I, I am seeing the benefit of saying spread the wealth. Yeah. Because when you do, like as, as Grand Chief uh, Stuart Phillips said, you know, a floating or a rising tide floats all boats. Exactly. And, uh, and that goes back to my point earlier that if there's money in communities, First Nations communities, they don't stick it in a pile, they spend it. And they're, they're going to spend it on making opportunity for their children. The fastest growing se uh, group in our community now in terms of population growth are First Nations. And so, you, when you look at all of the, the birth rates, birth rates are up for First Nations, they're down for everybody else. A component of being able to share opportunity, create wealth, is the quality of education that children are given as they enter into the, the journey of their life. Mm -hmm. Where are we at with education? We had this uh, a Court of Appeal ruling just yesterday. Um, when you look at the state of education in BC, how, how does it appear to you? I am a product of the public education system. I, when I was in grade nine, I was failing out. I was disinterested. I was 15. I'm not unique in that regard. Many people have that similar story. And it was teachers. That, <laughs> teachers grabbed me and said, Horgan, you can do better than that. And I got back on track and I ended up with a couple of university degrees and I'm the leader of the official opposition. And I owe it all, in my opinion, to public education. So I am a, a firm believer in making sure that we're making appropriate investments in our children and in the infrastructure that they need, their schools. But most importantly, the classrooms of today are harder to learn in and they're harder to teach in. When I talk to old folk like us, Stu, they say, oh, back in my day, well, your day's long gone. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got iPads. And, and not just everybody in British Columbia, but everybody around the world. And if our kids are gonna be competitive in that environment, we have to give them the tools to do so. And it starts <clears throat> with investing in public education. We have debt clocks all over the place. Where are the investment clocks? You know, every time government makes an investment in social infrastructure, hospitals, schools, and making sure that we have the people trained to give the, give the, the kids of today what they need to succeed, that benefits everybody. As it, we have an abundance of wealth and an unparalleled bounty here in British Columbia. It's being squandered by politicians that have a narrow vision. We need a broad vision that includes everybody, and we're not getting it today. We can so, do better. So you're singing off the same song sheet as Andrew Petter, which doesn't come as a surprise. I'm a very, very big fan of Andrew Petter. So. <laughs> but as president of SFU, he said, if we invest more in education, we can start to make up some of that five to six billion dollars in lost economic opportunity, let alone the five to six hundred million dollars that that would mean in taxes. That's right. Yeah. Which leads into social, other social programs that help families uh, be able to provide the, the opportunities for their own children. They're able to go to work. Mm -hmm. They know that their children are looked after. Social services, it's, it's a big issue here. And people go, we're giving away the store. Uh, it, we're not. <clears throat> and uh, again, uh, we talk about uh, raising the minimum wage. Most low wage earners, when they get a couple of bucks, they don't put it in an offshore account in the Caymans. They spend it. They circulate it within the community, oftentimes in small businesses, which gives opportunity for growth. And, and entrepreneurs can see, OK, if I, I, I can expand my facility now because there's more money in the community. The biggest challenge of all of the inventory you just did there is childcare. And we are falling way behind mostly Scandinavian countries and European countries who have recognized that there's no such thing, or very rare is it, that you have families with only one wage earner. You need both people to work. To meet. In the Lower Mainland, trying to pay mortgage uh, costs and all of the other costs of moving around and making sure that you're, you're, you're meeting your needs as well as your family's needs require two incomes. And the only way to do that is to have a, a vibrant and connected childcare system. And, and that's, that's a caring society that I think everybody wants to see. And do we have to pay for it? Yeah, we do. But in doing so, we open up so many more economic opportunities. But that's the part that people, I think, get hung up on, on the, do we have to pay for it? And they go, uh, because we've been given this message that if we don't create the environment that allows for investment and for companies to be able to, uh, you know, get a generous return on that investment. They won't be here, there won't be jobs, and therefore all of this will fall away. I toured the Ritchie Brothers auction facility in Burnaby 
state-of-the-art building. Yes, it 50, is. <laughs> 59 <laughs> child care spaces for all of the employees in the building. If uh, little, little uh, Stu's got a runny nose, you can leave your desk, you can go down, you can, you can give him some care and comfort that parents, only parents can give. And once he's calmed down, you can go back to your desk and continue working. It's a spectacular example of a corporation, a company saying, I'm going to invest in the kids of my employees and I'll have better employees as a result. So the big challenge, as I see for you, is to be able to communicate that message to business that they're going to be safe if you're in the Premier's office. I met with the BC Business Council last week. And what I heard around the table, Stu, was, well, Horgan, you're a smart guy, but... Mm -hmm. The but is, you're a new Democrat. And I said, you know what? Everybody's a new Democrat. They just don't know it yet. Most British Columbians have the same hopes and dreams and aspirations that I do for themselves and for their families. The trick is, how do we get there together? And it strikes me, and going back to the, 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 the frustration that we see in the, in the K-12 system right now with the BC Teachers Federation and the current government constantly at loggerheads, is that that is restricting our, creative, our creativity to solve problems because we're fighting with each other. We need to put down the cudgels, stop beating each other over the head, business, labor, and the environmental movement, and find ways to, to take advantage of our unparalleled wealth in a way that benefits everybody. It sounds like a simplistic bromide, but it's in the heart of most British Columbians. Let's just get on with it. Enough with the fighting. Let's take all of the creativity and the intelligence and the dynamism of British Columbia, perched here looking across the Pacific Ocean at the largest market known to, to history, and with the U.S. giant coming out of its slumber, we are in a, a, a privileged position, and we're squandering that privileged position because our government can't walk and chew gum at the same time, and it wants to pick fights every time it turns around. I don't want to fight with anybody. In the legislature this past week, we were talking about gun violence in Surrey. That's, a, that's not a partisan question. That's a public issue that requires all of our attention. The Premier got up and said, well, if the leader of the opposition would just put his politics aside, and I said, you're looking for a fight, and, I, and there's no fight here. I, I don't want to fight with you. I want to work with you. And she couldn't help herself because that's how they roll. As long as there's tension in their minds, pitting one group in society against another, they win. I mm. believe we need to stop that. I think most British Columbians want to stop that. And they want a government that puts their interests ahead of just sustaining the government. 16 years by the next election, these people will have been in power. Time to rid BC of them, at least for a term. Let's see if I can do a better job. I know I can. Thank you very much. Nice All to the talk best to you. To you. Yeah. Appreciate it.